which dancers carry themselves and realize that that feeling, one of being so small, so fragile, was one that I craved too. So I bought a box, took it home with me, and drank a cup before bed. Now I expected to lose weight almost instantaneously, but what I actually experienced was a horrible, gut-wrenching cramps, followed by a disgusting round of explosive diarrhea the next morning. Had I read the label more carefully and Googled the ingredients, my body's reaction would have been apparent. The key to the detox tea's flavor was an herb called senoglycoside, which also happens to be the main ingredient in many stool softeners. I had essentially, unknowingly, chugged a mug full of liquid laxatives. But the truth was, once I was done, I felt a wave of ecstasy wash over me, one that I had never experienced before. It was a feeling of being full of my own emptiness, complete and utter emptiness. I could feel my hip bones protruding. No matter how hard I tried, I couldn't expand my stomach. Thanks to these teas, I had finally accomplished what I had set out to do in my pubescence, take up as little space as possible. Now, Senaglycoside is not, to my knowledge, an addictive substance. And no, drinking one cup of tea won't change your life forever. But when you consciously or subconsciously struggle with disordered eating or body dysmorphia, and get even a small taste of that faint, exhausting, delicious emptiness, any amount of weight you perceive yourself as gaining or bloating you imagine will be exacerbated. A cookie crumb can feel like it weighs 50 pounds. Your mind can trick you into believing that you're sucking up all the air in the room. So you turn back to the thing that made you feel good about yourself, and more importantly, gave you some semblance of control. For me, that was the tea. I needed to pursue that feeling for five more minutes, even if, and I did not realize this then, it would affect my body for a lifetime. And so, I took the tea every single night before I went to bed, and like clockwork, my body would eject whatever I had eaten the day before as soon as I awoke. I followed this pattern for almost two years, and coupled with a restrictive diet and near incessant exercise, I lost a lot of weight. But instead of asking me if I was okay, my friends and family told me I looked great. What's your secret? They wanted to know. Their encouragement and validation, but also the suggestive manner in which they hinted at something illicit, was all I needed to hear in order to keep my voice and my vice under wraps. But that all came to head two years later when I went away to college. Although I had calculated how much tea I would need in advance of leaving home, I hadn't been prepared for how my change in lifestyle would impact my body. I was eating differently and sleeping differently. My routine disrupted, I began struggling to digest meals. It felt as if every bite of food would tickle my throat, just waiting to come back up. So I ate smaller and smaller portions throughout the day, an apple here, a kind bar there. But my body was no longer gaining the nutrients it needed, and I was getting sicker and sicker. One second, I'd be chatting with a friend in the library and feel as if I needed to cough. The next, I had unwillingly projectile vomited all over my sweater. It felt as if my insides had turned against me. And when I went home, to spend Thanksgiving with my family, and my attempt at participating in our annual meal resulted in me crying on the bathroom floor. My mother forced me to go see a specialist and get to the bottom of what was wrong. Let me be as clear as humanly possible. Consistently consuming detox teas in my adolescence absolutely destroyed my digestive system. Over the course of two years, I was diagnosed with two chronic digestive illnesses, first with celiac disease, followed by gastroparesis. Because of the laxative effect of the teas, the nerve endings that line my stomach are permanently damaged, and I digest food so slowly that I have to be constantly mindful of what, when, and how I put everything into my body. I take daily medication to help with the acidity of having an empty stomach for hours at a time. If I go even a day without taking my medication, I experience writhing pain in my abdomen, heartburn, reflux. It basically feels like my digestive tract has been set on fire. Some days, I get so bloated and uncomfortable that I struggle to get out of bed. But the worst part, definitely, is the involuntarily <laughs> spinning up of my meals, which can happen at any time with very little warning. Quite frankly, it's disgusting, and it's a demeaning illness that's difficult to manage. 
and I will have to do so for the rest of my life. But I am in recovery, and mentally, I am healthier than ever before. I now see my body as a source of strength because I put it through so much, and it still stands tall. But not all have been this lucky. Since speaking out about my experience, I have been contacted by so many people who confess to be struggling with what I have personally referred to as laxative-based bulimia. These people are young and old, male and female. They range from every race, size, and class. But they all have one thing in common. They've been struggling in silence and in shame, unaware that anyone else had identified this as a real problem or a real illness, a real form of disordered eating. These products are sold in grocery stores, pharmacies, and bodegas, hidden in plain sight amongst everyday household items. They are in our mother's kitchen cabinets and in our little sister's backpacks. I was just a child when I made a decision that I had no idea would impact me for the rest of my life. And I had no clue what I was doing to my body. And I have to live with the consequences of my ignorance until the day I die. No one else's child should have to bear that burden, and no adult should shoulder this secret shame alone. A bullet on its own is just a bullet, but when locked and loaded, we all know it can escalate into something much more deadly. If we're going to examine the impact of these products, it would be irresponsible not to look closely at the context in which they are used. It's time to step back and take in the big picture before it's too late. Thank you. My goodness, Iman, thank you for speaking out. I know that can't be easy, but I think your bravery is inspiring and will inspire other young people to confront this. I think you're doing a lot of good by sharing your struggle. And we're grateful that you're here to get that story on the record. Thank you. Please. Um, good morning, my name is Carrie Donahue, and I'm here today on behalf of the National Eating Disorders Association to express our strong support for New York City Bill Number 1485. Um, thank you to Chairperson Levine for, um, and all the members of the Committee on Health for the opportunity to speak today. Um, and thank you to all the advocates for speaking out and sharing your stories on this really important issue. Um, I currently serve as the Public Policy Manager at the National Eating Disorders Association, which is also known as NIDA. NIDA is the largest national organization supporting families and individuals affected by eating disorders and is based right here in New York City. NIDA serves as a catalyst for prevention, cures, and access to quality care. I am proud to be with you here today to speak about the importance of this legislation and its impact on the eating disorders community. Um, first, I would like to thank you, Councilmember Levine, for your sponsorship of this important initiative. Um, we really appreciate your leadership um, in working to protect minors and other individuals across the city by limiting access to these Senna and Saffron-based products. These products are often included in things like dietary supplements and sold with claims of weight loss. They are often sold without evidence supporting their efficacy or safety and pose a particularly concerning risk to those struggling with or at risk for developing an eating disorder. Eating disorders such as anorexia nervosa, binge eating disorder, bulimia nervosa, and others are extremely serious, potentially life-threatening conditions. 30 million Americans will suffer from an eating disorder at some time in their life. In New York City, the number of people currently struggling with an eating disorder is estimated to be approximately 848,000. Eating disorders have the second highest mortality rate of any mental illness, right behind the current opioid crisis. As you mentioned earlier, eating disorders do not discriminate. They affect people of all genders, races, ages, and socioeconomic backgrounds. Research does show that weight loss products such as detox teas and other dietary supplements sold for weight loss can be a catalyst for these life-threatening illnesses. 35% of normal dieters progress to pathological dieting. Of those, 25% will progress to partial or full syndrome eating disorders. These products, including those with Senna and Saffron, often give false claims about a miracle weight loss, which can be very harmful to those struggling with eating disorders, 
causing some individuals to aim for unreachable and frankly dangerous expectations. Recent research that has just been published this month from the Harvard School of Public Health found that adolescent and young adult women who used over-the-counter diet pills or laxatives for weight control were six times more likely than peers who did not use these products to be diagnosed with an eating disorder within one to three years of beginning use of these products. In addition, any product that encourages people to intentionally lose weight is directly perpetuating weight stigma, discrimination, or stereotyping based on a person's body size. For people with eating disorders, discrimination or the fear of discrimination if their weight increases um, is a necessary result of improved health and recovery can be a matter of life and death. Nita would also like to emphasize the potential of these and similar substances to contribute to poor body image in youth, which has been correlated to a number of problematic outcomes, including suicidality. Nita views this initiative as an important step toward the prevention of eating disorders in the city of New York. For these and other reasons, Nita asks the committee to support this important initiative to protect residents of New York City from Senna and Saffron-based products and to take steps to keep these products out of the hands of our youth. Thank you for your time and consideration, and thank you again for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you, Kara. I just have to clarify a number that you shared with us. The number of people currently struggling with an eating disorder in New York City, you cited as 848,000. That's an estimated number, but yes. Uh, that is an astounding figure. We understand it's an estimate, but any number anywhere close to that, it's alarming. And it's a reminder that this, does, this is not just a national challenge, it is a New York City challenge, which is why we must confront it here in the City Council. Thank you very much. Um, Sarah? Hi, everybody. Councilman Levine, I'd like to thank you so much for bringing up this very important issue that impacts so many. Just as Renee was saying before, a lot of people who suffer with eating disorders do so in silence. And a lot of times, people's parents encourage them in these unhealthy behaviors because that's what pop culture says <laughs> what the right thing to do is. These parents think that they're helping children. Uh, my name is Sarah Hamill-Smith. I am a plus-size model, digital influencer, TEDx presenter, and storyteller. And my professional background previously was advertising and public relations. So I understand the power of marketing and the way that marketing can impact people's behavior. Um, I was body shamed for most of my life. And as a child, my mother gave me, when I was around 12, I started to gain some weight. And my mother gave me these detox teas to take, um, thinking that she was helping me. Um, this progressed into, as I got older, eating disorders. I was anorexic, I was bulimic. I used to pass out in school and faint. Um, and all everyone surrounding me ever told me was that they were proud of me and proud that I was losing weight and proud of how beautiful I was looking. Um, I spent most of my life feeling ashamed of myself, ashamed of my body, regardless of what I accomplished in my professional life or my personal life, nothing mattered. All that mattered was that my body was fat and I wanted to be thin. Um, until in my mid to late 20s when I discovered, funny enough, a group of women on Instagram that were plus size models. And I had this transformative experience where I realized, oh my God, like nothing's wrong with me. It's the marketing, it's the marketing. It's pop culture telling people that something's wrong with them when nothing is and it, forcing perfectly healthy people to adopt these extremely unhealthy behaviors under the guise of health. So I dedicated my life to empowering and inspiring others and educating others about these different issues, um, which is what brings me here today. Um, I just, sorry, let me check my notes. <laughs> You're doing um, great. <laughs> um, oh, I just wanted to share something. Recently, I went to the doctor for an annual checkup, and everything came back perfectly healthy. 
The doctor actually shook my hand and said, congratulations, Sarah, you've achieved great health, but you need to lose weight. And I wanted to share that today just to bring up how systematically ingrained this unproven correlation between thinness and health is in society. Like the doctor's lit a doctor is literally telling me, congratulations, you've achieved great health. And in the same breath telling me that I need to lose weight. When every, every single thing that was checked, all the things that, that say that my body's perfectly healthy are coming back clean, she's telling me that I still need to lose weight. And it's so damaging. I know people who have been refused gynecological examinations because of their weight. I know people that have been refused care from doctors. I have a friend that had a tumor in her brain that they, they, wouldn't, they didn't diagnose and took too long to diagnose because everything was just like, oh, you're fine, you just need to lose weight. And so this pop cultural issue of the way that society views that fat is so bad, and it's extremely damaging. And to get back to the issue that we're discussing here today, it is an extremely important conversation. As, as we can see, it has many ripple effects. I think that it's so important that we're here talking about this. This is a great, great place to be, to be starting, to, to really take a look at what are we promoting as healthy, what are we, what are we providing to children as, as being healthy, what are we seeing, what are we educating parents, what are we telling parents that this is something good. Like I said, my, my mother gave me this tea. Renee's mom gave her this tea. Um, you know, it's really frightening, and, and again, I, I want to congratulate all of you for bringing up this very important um, conversation. Thank you so much, Sarah, uh, for being with us and for sharing your story. Uh, it's so important. Um, Iman and Kerry referenced the fact that this condition can affect young people of any background, of any race, of any gender identity. I wonder if you could speak to the particular challenges that people who don't, who, uh, who might not be uh, young white women would face in seeking treatment uh, for these disorders. Sure. Well, you have to understand that the conversation around disordered eating is not as I guess, evolved or pervasive as the conversation around mental health and mental wellness. Women, I'd say that the majority of women that I know have struggled with some form of disordered eating or body dysmorphia, but if they don't have the resources, if they aren't given um, the education or the environment at home to openly discuss how they feel about their bodies and themselves, they're not going to be able to diagnose themselves or understand what they're going through or get the help that they need. So additionally, a woman of color from a lower income background is uh, statistically less likely to be taken seriously by medical, hair, me medical care professionals. Um, they um, are less likely to be heard um, by schools and by educational professionals. Ultimately, like this is a pro this is a problem that isn't being broadcasted, and this conversation is so um, is is so overarching that people think of it as a part of the daily landscape, not really something that is being discussed in courtrooms. It's, it's commonplace. People don't, even, uh, people don't even blink when discussing things like diet supplements or detox teas. And it would be foolish to think that only the few women that are in positions of privilege and power that speak up are the ones who are suffering. That is not the case, and they only are using their platform to, I suppose, raise the voices of those around them from more marginalized backgrounds and communities. Thank you. Um, Iman and Sarah, both, you both discussed the role that social media played in, in, in 
your mistaken impression that these products were healthy. I wonder if you could speak more broadly about what this means for young people that uh, celebrities with millions of Instagram followers are accepting money to push these products. What impact does that have on young people? Well, I actually, in my testimony, mentioned that in my personal experience, this was brought to my attention from a friend, not social media. This, my problem, outdated the invention of Instagram as well as the popularization of other social media platforms. Um, I have been able to bear witness to their normalization through the use of streaming services and online platforms. Um, but I just wanted to clarify that I think the fact that I was able to walk to a convenience store on my block and buy 50 boxes of tea to bring home for a semester of college um, is uh, suggests that this problem is overarching, larger than social media, and if the internet were to black out tomorrow, God willing, we would all still be struggling with tackling this issue because it really, it's, it's, it looms so much larger than our smartphones. With that being said, uh, I think that uh, the effect of social media on the mental health of adolescents is one that um, I, touches every single, every single conversation that you will engage in when you're talking about the health of youths. Like, but I think Part of the issue is um, older adults thinking that thinking that um, it's as simple as a Kardashian Instagramming about the the teas. I mean, it's it's not that simple. You have to think. Remember that um, health and wellness and fitness Instagrammers with much smaller followings have been posting about products like these for decades and um, as long as Instagram has been around and those people have much smaller, more dedicated followings. If anything, I'd say that um, Gen Z is more quote unquote woke and they, they can see through the the propaganda of people like the Kardashians because of they've been called out for so many missteps, cultural appropriation, um, the perpetration of diet culture, etc. It's more so the, the nano influencers, in my opinion, and in my experience, and the friends and the family that can have this pervasive effect. And also, when we're talking about social media, I think the the greater danger that we have to be aware of is that it just further perpetrates this um, ideal of the uh, female beauty standard. And I have a 13 year old cousin who is constantly trying to look like the, um, the standardized Instagram model of beauty. And I see her uh, sort of contorting her figure and her appearance to fit in with that image. And I think that this is something that, again, has outdated Instagram because I grew up without Instagram. It was invented when I was in high school and I still felt like I needed to conform to a different standard of beauty that revolved around thinness. So social media and Instagram is only a product of the problem, not the problem itself. But um, yeah, I, I realize I'm rambling, but I would just say that I believe that if you have a platform, you have a responsibility to educate yourself about what you are selling. Thank you. Uh, I believe Councilmember Holden has a question. Yes, thank you all for your testimony. Again, it's an education. Um, and uh, I want to say that just the fact that they're marketing a tea, because we're all taught that teas are good. We're all taught that teas are, you know, are healthy. So by putting a drug like this, a laxative, in a tea, I think that's irresponsible. But the marketing uh, or the warning labels, I don't know, Iman, were the warning labels, did they tell you that you shouldn't drink this every day? Or I can't speak to what I looked at and read on the box um, when I was 16 at the time, and I don't remember the first time I saw it but it was as unassuming as possible. Um, it was marketed as a cleanse, a health product. 
Um, I did not feel appropriately warned about what would happen to my body if I took them consistently. And I also want to note that I live on Houston and Mott, and I recently went to a deli around the corner from my apartment, and I looked for the exact same brand of tea that destroyed my digestive system years ago. It was still being sold between the green tea and the Earl Grey. Right. Yeah, so that, that's exactly my point. But I just want to say I, I admire your testimony. Your, your testimony is well written. It's, it's wonderful. I think it should be required reading in our schools uh, because this is, no, this is a very important point. Most, this, this is an amazing story, and I'm sorry it happened to you, but I, I really want to thank you for coming today and, and warning other people about this situation. And, and parents should also read this, but I think it should. We should give it to the Department of Health to pass it around um, if, if, with your permission, but it should be, um, may, everybody should be aware of this. And thank you so much, all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks and I just here. wanted to quickly add that I think the most important, I'm so pro this ban because I think ultimately while it's important that parents are educated about the warning signs and what to look for and the brands of tea and when in the day and how routinely their children are drinking said teas, um, I gaslit my parents for years about what was in these teas and I was lying to myself as well as them. So I think I'm very um, for a complete ban on the sale of these products to minors. I think it's the most effective way to stop them from purchasing the teas. And yes, uh, I wasn't expecting the um, administration's testimony to make me so emotional, but as I was listening to them discuss what I see as their negligence, it made me realize how so many are suffering while we sit in here in this in this small room and discuss the fate of so many um, bright and opportunistic individuals. So thank you. Thank you. And at the end of the day, we are here to consider a legislative proposal which would do exactly what you said. Make it so that a 16-year-old in the city can't just stroll into a store in their neighborhood and pick up dozens of these boxes as you yourself uh, related having done. This is about uh, protecting kids from easy access to products which are not good for them, which feed the kind of terrible body image stereotypes which contribute to low self-esteem, which contribute to eating disorders, and which are part of a broader corporate effort to push only one type of body image as the ideal of beauty for young people. And we are taking a stand against that and in favor of a concrete proposal to protect the young people of New York City. And despite the very disappointing response of the administration today, we are not going to back down in this fight. We're gonna push as the city's legislative body to pass this bill on behalf of young people in New York City. Thank you to all of you for adding your voices to this debate. It was incredibly important and powerful to have you on the record. Uh, I admire your bravery. Thank you very, very much. And this will conclude our hearing.